Okay, welcome back to another moderator uh, prep source review. This time it's for a conversation coming up between Bill Gertz and Victor Xi on US policy towards China. Uh, so the first set of sources we're gonna cover are basically ones that deal with the background of China as a, a state and a country, uh, just to sort of give some, uh, some historical uh, reference and background to set everything in context. Uh, so this will be covering like 4,000 years of history in a relatively short manner. So just a disclaimer that it's going to be really high level. There's a lot more that you can dig into, obviously, uh, than what I'm going to review here. So um, we'll start off kind of going back. Uh, and one thing to note is that China has been around uh, really for a very long time. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that it's, it's quite geographically isolated. Um, it's obviously way over on the eastern end of uh, Asia. It's got kind of an ocean on one side. It's got a big uh, kind of inhospitable plateau separating it from the rest of uh, Eurasia, Asia, Central Asia. Uh, and then it has the Himalayas kind of on its, um, you know, southwestern flank. So it's just kind of in this little, or not little, actually very big, uh, isolated region. And uh, one of the things to pay attention to is that throughout its history, it's really been, it's tried to basically secure its borders, but then it's also had a bunch of uh, internal conflict. So that's kind of the two, from a security standpoint, two things that uh, the Chinese are quite, you know, they're going to be paying attention to. Let's keep the, uh, the, the foreign invaders from coming in from the north uh, or by sea, and let's uh, keep the internal border stable and not uh, falling apart. Uh, this obviously has been kind of a cyclical thing. So uh, there have been plenty of internal and very bloody uh, conflicts within China itself, kind of a bunch of civil wars. Um, and so from this, you get kind of the the Chinese military philosophy, which is really, or, and state philosophy, which is kind of a combination of uh, the art of war, uh, the warring states period, which is this sort of tumultuous period. Uh, and then, you know, Wei Qi, which is like, you know, we want to encircle our enemies uh, rather than going and kind of doing head on attacks. Uh, so it really becomes kind of like a, uh, a deception and strategy game as opposed to, uh, you know, something like Napoleon, where it's just like, let's just go smash them up front. Or um, even like some of the Greek wars were like that. Uh, so the other influence here from the ancient times uh, of China is Confucius. And uh, what what his teachings were. And uh, one thing to note is that basically uh, it, it's not so much a religion about the afterlife as it is a code of conduct for life uh, right now. But the, the prime goal is basically to have a righteous emperor who would receive the mandate of heaven, that's what it's called uh, in this language, and bring internal, internal stability to the region and then ultimately make China the center of the universe. So the whole thing is about balance and order and internal harmony, because uh, that's what leads to you basically being able to, um, I wouldn't say necessarily rule everything, but uh, it, it just allows you to be at the pinnacle of your civilization from a Chinese perspective. So that's kind of like the backdrop. There's several empires uh, and dynasties, I guess is what they're called in this language that kind of try to achieve that. Um, that brings us up to the 19th century, which in the Chinese world is known as the century of humiliation, but it basically is uh, the century of decline of the Qing dynasty, which is sort of the last dynasty before uh, the revolution that takes place later. And essentially what happens is you ha have this kind of like fading and dying uh, dynasty plus a really strong set of European powers who are trying to engage in trade and mercantilism. And so they kind of come in the area as they have, you know, engaged in trade around the world and they want to get access to the market in China uh, and then also trade. And um, much like a lot of these types of scenarios where there is a lot of immigration, a lot of uh, increased trade from the outside, it creates tensions, especially in the face of a weaker uh, state domestically. And uh, this basically leads to a bunch of problems. And eventually you have the Opium Wars, the Boxer Rebellion, and then the just kind of the fall of the uh, Qing Dynasty, basically in 1912. And this results in kind of a civil war. Um, 
obviously when the center of power goes down, a bunch of people will scramble to try and fill the void. So on one hand, you have this guy named Chiang Kai-shek, uh, who is uh, kind of a, a Chinese nationalist. He's backed by uh, more of the Western side, including uh, the United States. And then you have Mao, uh, which is basically taking a communist stance, um, you know, kind of backed by uh, the communists, obviously, obviously over in Russia. Um, so there's kind of the civil war that happens. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek ends up leaving and going to Taiwan. Uh, Mao takes over mainland China. And, uh, you know, you end up having kind of like a typical communist dictatorship uh, full with purges, uh, massive famine, uh, a bunch of a failed industrial policy that leads to that famine and other problems. Uh, they have the one child policy at this time, uh, they have cultural revolution, and uh, they basically shift their alliance kind of grows with Russia during this time. Uh, they get a bunch of military support from them, uh, and also military technology. And, you know, that's kind of that whole era. Uh, kind of like through the 50s and 60s. It does shift at the end of the 60s. Uh, basically, uh, there was kind of this, this is a very high level, but the Russians were hoping that kind of like the rest of Eastern Europe, they were going to be able to kind of just mesh in and take over uh, the area. I think that was kind of their calculus. And uh, it turns out that Mao really didn't want to be under the thumb of the Soviets. So after he's kind of milked them for a bunch of support and military um equipment, etc. Um, he realizes that there needs to be kind of a, a shift in who is the benefactor of the country. And so that kind of aligns also with what the United States is trying to do, which is to drive a wedge uh, between the Russians and the Chinese, because it creates a, a powerful block. Um, uh, the, the Russians are also kind of engaged in Afghanistan, too. So that also kind of freaks out China because they don't want to be encircled. Um, so that kind of combination of stuff towards the end of the Mao era uh, kind of drives China more towards the U.S. and away from Russia. Um, so you kind of have this reform period uh, after Mao. There's a bit of a succession problem. There's kind of like the hardliner communists who don't really, who just hate the United States uh, from an ideological perspective because they see them as the capitalists. So it's kind of, sort of an ideological motivation. And then you have this more practical side. Uh, which is kind of characterized by a guy named uh, Deng Xiaoping, who ends up taking over from Mao at the end. He sort of wins this succession battle. And uh, he basically engages on a bunch of reforms, um, partially out of necessity, partially uh, to work with the United States closer. But he goes to the United States and they begin basically embracing some capitalistic, or I should say uh, not capitalistic because that gets confused sometimes, but really uh, more free market oriented. Not completely, but... Uh, obviously much more than they had before. They let the market essentially set prices and allocate resources more than they did. Uh, so this starts, uh, really kicks off uh, growth of the Chinese economy. Uh, it also creates stability, or excuse me, instability. Um, there is kind of like this tension between opening up to the rest of the world and gaining the economic benefits of that, but also not trying to completely destabilize your society. Uh, that does kind of happen with the Tiananmen Square situation where some students uh, who want to be more democratic do this kind of uprising and China, uh, the Chinese government really cracks down on them hard. And um, some people are, uh, I guess, allegedly never seen again. It, it's one of these sort of hard crackdowns. So there's sort of this tension period where China is trying to thread the balance between opening up, uh, becoming an economic player, but not losing its soul to uh, the West or being too overly controlled about it. This kind of continues through the 90s uh, and 2000s. Um, the United States, at this point, you know, communism is very much dead. Russia collapses. The United States is sort of the sole king of the world. And it kind of expects that with more engagement and bringing China into the international system, it's kind of going to go the way of the rest of Europe. Uh, and uh, or I should say Eastern Europe and um, uh Japan and South Korea went where it'll kind of bring bring it into the fold of this international system. Uh, this kind of plays along with the um, quote unquote, like liberal uh, internationalist school of the United States, you know, neocons, basically everyone who wants to bring everyone together into sort of this international trading uh, system headed up by the United States. Um, so the strong belief at that time was basically that, look, China is on the road to a more democratic and liberal uh, type of country, and it's going to join 
the uh, liberal world order that the United States has set up, uh, kind of like it did with mixed success in other countries. Um, this unfortunately doesn't really seem to work. So uh, there's sort of a transition period, but really by uh, 2009, uh, kind of when Obama takes over, uh, and then you know when she subsequently takes over, uh, the sort of more nationalist uh, closed mind, closed or sort of China oriented side uh, takes over in China and um, really sort of begins to be a little bit more openly hostile. A um, bunch of purges happen under Xi. Uh, they kind of rejigger their economy to be um, more preferential to themselves. They kind of always did that. There's a bunch of uh, stealing of technology that becomes uh, more overt and open and understood. And uh, really, I'd say Obama kind of, Obama really is the last administration where people still feel like, uh, you know, China could be reformed into this kind of democratic side of things. And it really much marks the turning to more of what Trump uh, was saying, which is that China's a real threat and we need to crack down on them. Um, so that kind of leads us up to today. Um, China is now kind of considered, I think, a threat by most. I think the the sort of dovish camp is not so much there anymore. China seems like it's trying to, uh, excuse me, replace the United States as the global hegemon, or at least not be under its, uh, it basically be able to assert its will on its own without the United States uh, influence. And so anyway, that brings us up to uh, where we're at at the moment. Um, okay, so that's kind of the first round. Uh, we'll continue with some other uh, source videos in a little bit here.